Welcome to the Santa Cruz Coffee Break. If you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts, please follow, hit the like button, or any subscribes. It really helps us with the algorithms. Santa Cruz Coffee Break is produced by the Santa Cruz Guitar Players Forum. All opinions are those of the speakers. We invite you to join us on the Santa Cruz Guitar Players Forum at SCGCPF for more fun. Now, let's get on with this installment of Santa Cruz Coffee Break. We would like to welcome Tim Penn to the Santa Cruz Guitar Players Podcast. This is number 79. And Tim is now the Global Director of Sales, Marketing, and Artist Relationship for this company called Santa Cruz Guitar Company. So, Tim, welcome in. Um, what a what fun to have you. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, we're excited about this. Um, uh, how did you come to us? How did you come to Santa Cruz Guitar? Oh, well, I'll, I can work it. Let me work. Let me go from the beginning of how I started playing guitar and how I ended up at Santa Cruz. That's probably a <laughs> more interesting story. So, um, my uh, one of my best friends had older brothers and sisters, and so we'd hang out at his house. And one day, I found the the forty five of the Rolling Stones Satisfaction, having no idea what it was, and we put that single on the stereo, and that was the day that I wanted to learn to play guitar. That song was the one that kicked it all off. And so I started asking my parents for a guitar. And my mom, who was a piano player, said, well, you have to learn to play piano first. And so I always tell the joke, it'd be like, practice for a half an hour, can I have a guitar yet? Next day, <laughs> practice for a half an hour, can I have a guitar yet? And eventually they gave in and bought, bought me my first acoustic guitar, um, which I think the action maybe lasted about six months before the next started to go the wrong direction and it was really fortuitous i had a my favorite teacher of all time was my middle school high school middle school choir director and he knew i had an interest in guitar and the choir was doing i know it was the carpenters calling occupants of interplanetary crafts which had an electric guitar part it had like a written out electric guitar solo and he literally sat me down after school, taught me all the chords, taught me where all the notes were for the solo. And that really, once that happened, you know, I would play in church. I played with the, the jazz band. I played with the show choir. I had my own little, you know, middle school, high school rock band with my friends and just loved, loved the instrument, loved playing the instrument. I think I, I figured out very early. In fact, this is another good story. So my father ran a, a snowmobile company in the 70s, and they used to do these distributor meetings where they'd bring all the people in, and they would take pop songs of the day and rewrite them to be product songs. They were hilarious. <laughs> and my father arranged for me to sit in the orchestra. I say orchestra pit. It was like a 10 or 12-piece band. Um next to the guitar player for the whole two days and so you know they'd they'd play their songs and they'd go off to you know breakout rooms for meetings and so we just chat so i you know i'd ask them things like how often do you practice and like how many nights do you play and by the end of the two days i realized that i did not want to be a professional guitar player because it was too hard and i didn't <laughs> ever feel like i was ever going to be i mean this guy was amazing um it may have even been have been Tim Sparks, but it's so long ago I don't remember. Um, but someone who played like Tim, and so I just played a ton of guitar wherever I had the opportunity. But I also realized that because I was a bit of an audiovisual nerd, that if you could run the soundboard, you got to hang out at a lot more gigs. And so I started doing live sound, and. Yeah. Um, you know, I do it for school concerts. I did it for the theater. So I was still involved in music and I was still playing guitar, but I found a way to get paid, um, you know, to be involved in the music industry. And so I went off to college in Philadelphia and was in the music department there. I actually, I was, it was, the, I went to the school because you could get a dual major in music and business. So I thought, well, one or the other might work out. That's um, cool. That's cool. Drexel University? 
Got it. And um, so I went out there and the school secretary hooked me up with a guy who was the maintenance tech at a, a local studio. And I started doing just soldering, right? Like I'd solder some patch bays or I'd make some microphone cables. And then they're like, hey, um, if I teach you how to edit tape, do you think you could do a little bit of editing? And I was like, sure. My first project was taking five hours of telephone interviews with Philadelphia Gasworks customers and editing them down to little commercials. Some poor person had literally transcribed the entire thing. And then someone had gone through with a highlighter and I had to piece all those bits together. And so yeah, I did that. I was, um, you know, uh, working at studios. And then I got an opportunity to go back to Minneapolis, which is my hometown and home state and uh, work at Paisley Park for Prince. So I spent two years there as a staff engineer. Um, I worked primarily on the Diamonds and Pearls record, but at that point, Paisley Park was a public studio. So I spent time with George Clinton of Parliament Funkadelic. I spent time, a little bit of time with REM. I spent some time with the Pointer Sisters, lots of local Minneapolis bands. And it was a cool time to be in the studio scene because the alternative music scene in Minneapolis was phenomenal. In the replacements, you had Husker Du, you had the Jayhawks, you had all these phenomenal um, bands. And so I loved it. But I, after two years mm -hmm. of being on a beeper, where when your beeper went off, you had 45 minutes to get to the studio, I just kind of burned out. And so I had an opportunity to go join a, uh, a school that was building recording studios for the purpose of having a recording program. And so I did that for about, I think it was about three years. Um, and I, one of my students uh, ended up being Prince's engineer for a long time. In fact, and he just actually was the engineer on the latest Peter Gabriel record. So, and, but he'll tell you, he didn't learn anything about recording from me. What he learned from me was how to deal with the people. So. <laughs> probably the more important skill when you get yeah. down to it yeah i could try to, i could bore you for four hours with recording studio stories but that's not what i think i think you're probably about 10 years younger than me because um i was in the studios in the late 70s and 80s so it, parliament I, parliament funkadelic at that time yeah i spent some time there <laughs> and you remember it uh it was it was it was uh it was a challenge. Um, it was a challenge, uh, but uh, kind of the same career path. I mean, I was a musician and and had a chance to learn to do live sound and did live sound and and we were second act on a kind of a big tour and they said it turned out to be Joe Cocker and they said you know if you ever want to come to New York, we'll get you a job. And I got tired of getting close with bands we were in caribou doing a demo and the uh um fiddle player who i had brought into the band six weeks earlier decided they needed a different guitar player mm. <laughs> and i just kind of called these people up and they say yeah come on out to new york we'll find something for you yeah you know? and there was a lot of couches for a few weeks and then i got a job at hit factory oh cool. so Great yeah studio. yeah really at that time it was really yeah and, and so i i decided to get out of the recording industry i could see that lots of the big studios were closing a lot of them you know the adat sort of facilitate was the beginning of people cracking drums in the big room and then going home and doing all the overdubs or going to much smaller studios so yeah. i went and i got my master's degree in international management um and then went got into the professional audiovisual industry and so i worked for a couple of companies one that made control systems and switching systems and then another with it was the world's largest manufacturer of uh television mounts and projection screens and uh traveled the world learned a lot um and then i just decided that i really wanted to work in an industry where i had a passion for the product and I had lost my passion for professional audiovisual. 
So I gave myself a year to find my way into the industry and um, interviewed with Fender. They turned me down. And then about 60 days later, they called me and said, hey, we've got another opportunity for you. So I was um, the regional salesperson for half of Pennsylvania, all of New Jersey, and what I call the populated part of New York. So Hudson Valley, Man obviously Manhattan and five boroughs. Um, was there for eight years and then had an opportunity to go to Gibson. So I, I made the move and I was the... I had global commercial responsibility for amplifiers and pedals, which was um, Mesa Boogie, uh, the Maestro pedals, and then the the new Gibson amps, which were just launched a few months ago, which I thought was full circle because it was the it was the Maestro FZ1 that made <laughs> Satisfaction sound the way it did, and here I am relaunching Maestro pedals with Gibson, so that was fun, but. Um, in the transition from Fender to Gibson, there's a group of us that went to the Luthier Showcase up in Woodstock. And Richard Hoover, Richard Hoover and I stayed in the same Airbnb. And so I sent an email out to the group saying, hey, I've changed jobs. And Richard sent me a private email saying, I really wish I would have known you were looking. But by that point, it was too late. So fast forward a couple of years and Richard texted me and said, I, I, can I tap into your international experience for 20 minutes? I've got some questions about China. And I said, sure. So we're on the phone. I'm chatting with Richard and Rick and we get to the end of the conversation. And Richard says, do you know anybody that would be interested in coming and running sales for Santa Cruz? I said, yeah, me. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, it took whatever two or three weeks of negotiations and interviews and conversations. But so I joined Santa Cruz a little less than four months ago. Well, and, congratulations. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's probably the busiest I've been in the last 20 years. Um, <laughs> but it's by far the most fun I've had working for a guitar company. So it's a special group of people. It's an amazing and very special group of products. And uh, it's just really a thrill to be to be involved with the the luthiers and the team in Santa Cruz and the products, the dealers, the artists. So I'm a I'm a very happy guy. That's great. It, That's nice. It's, yeah. it's a um, it's a really interesting time for them right now too. These vault guitars were um, were quite unbelievably stunning. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've known Richard probably pretty close to 20 years and, um, I, 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 I've never remembered when they've made better guitars, you know, it, it, it truly is a golden era. Yeah. The guitars are amazing. I, um, you know, as an employee, it's very difficult to get a Santa Cruz guitar because by the time it comes to the end of the production line, it's, it's already sold to somebody. So I've, I've, I wanted to find a piece of Santa Cruz history for myself. So I, I, I just bought um, from uh, Griffin Guitars in California. I bought the Red Knot number 59. It's all Koa. It's from 1979. And I wanted it because I'm positive that Richard built the guitar and almost positive that his, his wife did the inlay. So, because she did a lot of the in, inlay work in the early days, so I have currently have that at the at the shop. They're plucking it for me and installing a pickup so I can use it as a demo guitar here in Nashville. Nice, nice. So I, I understand the waiting because you know I'm not exactly as an employee. I'm not first in line for the pluck machine, and uh, so I'm patiently waiting for my Santa Cruz guitar to arrive. <laughs> or not very patiently waiting. I, I saw that guitar at Griffin. Um, pretty special. I think Tad has um, number 37. I have number four. Do you really? Yeah. It, it's, it, it, it came up for sale. It, it's been, as Richard said, it's been through house fires, car accidents, stage accidents, you name it. Um, but yeah, it, it just because of the history of it. Uh, it's pretty cool. I actually have a, a few very cool Santa Cruzes. Nothing, you know, that are like mind-boggling. But I have D mm -hmm. number four. I have 
I think the first OMPW they made, Koa, Sitka. Um, and they have a couple of FTCs. Um, okay. Yeah, so. Yeah, and, F and FTC is definitely on my bucket list because that's a, I mean, I, I probably, I don't know, when I play acoustic guitar, I probably strum half the time and finger pick half the time. And that guitar just is amazing guitar for finger picking. Yeah, they, well, and they're just, they're just beautiful. I mean, the whole thing is just a beautiful instrument. So, yeah. Well, you know, that the reality is, is you really can't go wrong with almost any Santa Cruz guitar. I, I haven't seen one that didn't appeal to me. Um, although I have to admit that the PJs and the Fireflies are just a little too small for me. I, I, I can't seem to bond with a little tiny guitar like that. Um, but then again, I am a little bit like uh, um, uh, Red Riding Hood. Uh, I don't particularly like the particularly large ones either. So, <laughs> you know, that it's, or Goldilocks. It's, I'm sorry. I didn't, yeah, yeah, Goldilocks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, as a guitar manufacturer, if you think back, I mean, Richard talks about the, you know, the early days of Santa Cruz where nobody wanted anything but a dreadnought. Yeah. Like, yeah. don't even talk to me about a dreadnought. And today you walk into a store and you observe people playing and you see people picking up dreadnoughts, you see them picking up parlors, you see them even, you know, being here in Nashville, I try to get out and see music at least once, a, at least once a week, sometimes more than once a week. And I'm even starting to see things like OMs in bluegrass bands, you know, and it, if you think about it, the, the whole purpose of the dreadnought was projection when microphones were bad and PA systems were worse, if they even existed. Um, and now with, with all, with the pickup technology, with PA system technology, you just don't have to have as much volume out of the guitar. And if you're so someone who's a slight frame or not very tall, a dreadnought is, it, a lot of people do it, but I've talked to quite a few guitar players that are like, I, I prefer an OM, it's just much more comfortable for me to play on stage so yeah. i even think that there's all the different sizes but the you know you, you have to have a dreadnought to play in bluegrass or you have to have a, you know a parlor to, to do finger you know delicate finger style i think those that's all being very much blurred which is good for all of us in the industry yeah well, and I've never understood why the F doesn't get a lot more attention just because that's such a great all around guitar. And, you know, there's a period of time when, you know, Eric Clapton had one on the cover and, and that raised some awareness, but doesn't seem to be quite as in demand a model as the OM, but that's probably because Martin doesn't make one. And, you know, let's face it, Martin's been around a lot longer than anybody else. Um, and they're still an there's they're still an opinion leader, you know, yeah. And probably will be for a very very long time. So, too true. So, it, 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 when I started in the mid '60s, you didn't have the the choices. I mean, you you know there was Martin and Gibson, but a lot of them were duds. You know, yeah. I, I just just complete duds. Um, I had a first year D thirty five that was terrible, it, it, awful guitar. Um, don't know why I bought it because I bought it because it was a name. Yeah, you know, I mean that's what you did if you if you were playing coffee houses and doing that stuff. You you had to have it, and we have such a, a, a unbelievable selection of instruments and. A lot of them are really good, you know. Yeah. I, I, I made a joke about my first acoustic guitar, which lasted about six months. But if you think about, you know, Santa Cruz, the Santa Cruz customer is a very special customer. It's a very unique instrument. And certainly not everybody can afford a Santa Cruz guitar. But the fact that the quality of the, I'll call them entry level, it, I don't mean the $49 guitars on Amazon. I'm talking the low end of Martin, the low end of Fender, the low end of the Epiphone line at Gibson. Beginning guitar players are getting such a phenomenal choice of instruments to play that are quality instruments. 
I think it will it will inspire more of them to continue to play. You know, if I wouldn't have had access to some the guitars at the middle school that were much more much easier to play than my own, I could very well have given it up just because I couldn't press the strings down. Nobody in my family played guitar. I don't even know if there was anybody that repaired guitars in the small town that I grew up in. And I could very well have given it up. But I think that there's so many different ways to, whether it's acoustic or electric, there's so many different ways to learn now. There's so many different yeah. instruments to play. You know, you can have a, mar a hundred watt Marshall completely on 10 in a set of headphones at conversation levels with the, with the digital technology we have today. And so I think that it's, I'm hoping it, it builds more guitar players over time, you know, and we'll leave, we'll leave the, the COVID musical instrument industry <clears throat> phenomena aside. Um, but cause that was, that yeah. was a once in a, I don't know, hope I'm, not touch wood it's a that's a once in a lifetime experience ho ho hopefully yes yes yeah for yeah. sure okay. now you can become a really great craftsperson if you are adequately driven with even a poor quality tool but you give people good quality tools you're definitely going to generate a lot more skilled craftspeople and you'll find even more great artists i mean it's just the way it's going to work the the better the tools are the better the people are that are going to be picking them up and playing them and and encouraging them to get even better yep yeah and you know i mean music distribution used to be a very very controlled thing <laughs> and now you you know you can be a creative motivated person you don't have to be a virtuoso, but you, I know, as Richard always says, you can write a song that changes the world. Yeah. You know, and I think you have to weed through a lot more average, I think, sometimes to get to the, the really spectacular stuff. But, uh, you know, anybody that's, I figure anybody who is taking time to make art, and whether that's music or visual art or digital video art, they're sharing a piece of themselves with the world it makes the world a better place and it means they're probably not doing really terrible things they shouldn't be doing yeah you know um and so you know i'm I'm a big proponent of supporting people that you know want to that want to play music the you know I, I live in almost to the border of kentucky in in tennessee my wife and I have a 10 acre flower farm and the little local pizza place has music Thursday and Friday nights. And you can go down there and hear a rock band, a fusion band, a country band. And, you know, it's, is it going to see Jason Isbell or going to see Brad Paisley? No, but it's still people making music and making the world a better place. And, I, and I'm, I'm just really inspired by that at all different levels. So it's fantastic. It's just fantastic. It's it, it really is a, I don't know, I think 10 years ago, it, 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 I think there was a lot of people saying that guitar was dead. You know, that oh, it, was a, it was an article it, in it, it, Washington it, Post, I think. Yeah, that, 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 that said that. And now, I mean, we had um, Alex King on uh, last week. Um, and what's happening in bluegrass is beyond exciting. I mean, it, you know, you get you get you get a rocket ship like Billy Strings that fills Red Rocks. Yeah, I I lived in Bol I lived in Boulder. You would never have put a bluegrass band at Red Rocks. You know, they just they would have put a hundred people in there and this guy's filling it four times a year. It's, it, it's fantastic. I mean, it's, it, it, it's really opened up a lot so much. Um, yeah. And I, I think bluegrass, you know, if, if you took someone who's not in our industry and said, what do you think about bluegrass? They would say, well, it's like fiddles and songs about mountains. 
you know, which for a long time it was. Right? Probably. <laughs> but you look at someone like Molly Tuttle, who's taken on yeah, all yeah. kinds of different yeah. lyrical themes put together. I mean, if you've never seen the current version of Molly's band live, yeah, I would put it in top 10 shows I've seen in my life. They were, I saw them uh, at Americana Fest last year. No, a year before. I don't know. I lose track of time. But I walked out of the basement east and went, that was a phenomenal show. And not only because of the individual musicianship of, of the players, but the ensemble playing, the way they play together and off of each other, which has always been what bluegrass is about. Um, you know, I'm I'm really excited by that. And I try I try to go to a few writers' rounds whenever I can here in Nashville. And, you know, someone you've never heard of that says, well, this is my second writer's round. And this song, this is the fifth song I've ever written. And it's like, that's a great song. Keep playing it. Keep, you know, keep writing, keep playing. It's that's, that's what music is really all about and sharing it with other people, obviously. Yeah. yeah. I have to ask something because I've been reading about it for the past couple of days and you're in Nashville. What about Paisley's blue Paisley guitar? Have you heard well, this? I haven't. You know, Brad owns a lot of Telecasters. He does. He does. <laughs> and and what he came out and did early this week was he did an interview, a, a podcast with somebody who just whatever Paisley was feeding him. And I know he's got a sense of humor. I know he's a pretty good guy. Um, he came out with this and brought a blue floral and he says it's the only one <laughs> <laughs> and there's been all this speculation about it that it you know that all oh, well fender you know it, leo was cheap so if he had if he had the decals he probably put them on <laughs> and and then then you look at it and and all of a sudden well we haven't really seen any gut shots we haven't heard anything about it except him talking about it on this thing and he put a bender in it if it was a one-of-a-kind fender and i really think it's something he's doing with bill crook you know that there and, and i saw a um a thing with him like wednesday and he was playing the blue guitar at a nashville fender event yeah. so I'm sure there's a signature model and I'm sure it's going to be this blue floral, but that, 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 that clears up one, one, <laughs> one question in my world. And yeah. I gotta, I gotta ask you another one about Gibson. Um, we had John Thomas on about a month ago. Do you know who John is? He, wrote, Kal he wrote Kalamazoo gals. Okay. And I, I, I've known John a while, and I think John is probably the authority on early Gibsons. Um, I, I don't think anybody else. I, he explained the FON numbers. You know that yeah. what they were were ledger books that they bought from the from the stationery store, and they didn't they didn't have any sequence to them. So everybody that's been sitting here trying to figure them out, you know, and he knows that because he interviewed the woman that filled them out yeah you know and went went down and bought them yeah so it, let me finish i gotta 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 get this out before i lose it he says that there is a closet at gibson <laughs> where all the leather bound journals or books are truth or fiction it's truth. And so Matt Kohler, who is the vice president of product development, um, a, at some point in the last few years, he's constantly, he's a, he's, a, he's a historian. He's constantly searching for different pieces of Gibson history. And um, so do we have everything? No, a lot of it got dispersed when they shut down Kalamazoo. But when I when we were working on the 
um, the Gibson amps, he found this huge stash of like Gibson Maestro amplifier information, like blueprints and circuit, original circuit diagrams. So mm. I, I know Matt's trying his very best to consolidate as much of that as he can. You know, if you compare what he's doing to, you know, Dick Boke at Martin, where they never threw a piece of paper away, they saved, you know, the, every le log book, every ledger, every, yeah. you know, they probably still have the receipts from 1902. Um, you know, it's a lot easier to, and I'm not saying Dick's job was easy because that was a massive task to put together that archive, but that's the same type of thing that Matt's trying to do at Gibson. So do they have everything? No, but is he trying to acquire absolutely every piece of Gibson history that he can? Yes, he is. So it's, the 58, 59, and 60 Les Paul ledgers still haven't shown up. <laughs> you know, it's a the, bit like it's a bit yeah. like someone discovering they've got a, a you know, a Renaissance painting that's been hanging in their family bathroom for the last two, you know, 150 years. And it's like, oh, that's the painting that great, you know, great, great grandma gave to great, great grandma gave to ended up with my mom. And it's like, you know, that's a Vermeer or, you know, it's a it happens. <laughs> it happens. It really does. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's probably some because, you know, by the time they shut Kalamazoo down, the bursting was in its infancy, right? Like nobody yeah. was paying $450,000 for a 59 Les Paul. So they were shocked. 750. If, yeah, they were shocked if it was, I was going to say they were shocked if it was 2000, right? Um, and so I don't know if that would have had necessarily monetary value but it probably had some serious sentimental value to someone who had worked on all those guitars and wasn't moving to Nashville to come work for Gibson was now no longer going to be working for Gibson. You know, that people, people hold on to those little tokens of their history um, either for their own enjoyment or to pass on to the next generation. So we'll see it on the antiques roadshow. Yeah. Someday. Could very well be. Yeah. Could yeah, very probably. well be. Of course, it, it's a lot like some of the early Santa Cruz records too, where you know things just kind of got jotted on on index cards and filed, hopefully, <laughs> and not necessarily in any particular order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, Dan at the shop is his one of his projects is to take all the production cards and scan them into you know, to create a digital version with the serial number, which is great for me because I get all the emails of, hi, I have D, you know, one, two, six, seven. Can you tell me what woods it is and what's the bridge and, you know, the nut and bridge spacing? So I can't always find everything, but there's a lot of information there. And it's funny because most people are really disappointed by like, uh, your your guitar is the standard specifications, which are the same today as they were 15 years ago. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, what, what's really what's really amazing is Richard's memory, because oh. Richard remembers virtually every guitar oh. I swear that's been through that shop. Oh. When I bought this FTC, uh, it had uh, a cedar top. And I mentioned it to Richard. I said, oh, I found this guitar. You won't believe it. Da, 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 da. And I, I mentioned that it, it had the cedar top. And he goes, does it have a little black blemish in the back? And I said, yeah. How would you remember that? And he goes, oh, I remember making that guitar. And I wanted to throw it away and make a new one because of that blemish. But, uh, you know, my partner at the time said we couldn't afford it. So we had to send it out. And I'm like, this is this is 30 something years ago. You've had how many thousand guitars go through the shop and you remember that detail on that guitar? <laughs> it was amazing. In, in I, was really, cases, I was shocked. In some cases, he can remember who he bought the wood from. Yeah. You know, um, you know, if it's East Indian Rose, I think actually I think they've been getting East Indian Rose from the same place for a long time. He's got some very, very long standing relationships with suppliers. Um, but yeah, the things that that guy can remember at 70, however many years old he is. I mean, I'm only 57. I can't remember a 
ten percent of what that guy remembers. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. frightening. Uh, and and what that, and, and part of what's so lovely is he will share that with anyone. You know, we do shop tours every week, and there was a a New York customer that I helped specify a guitar for, and. So the dealer reached out and said, hey, you know, our customer's going to be in Northern California. Can they get a tour? Just happy, happened to be in Santa Cruz or around Santa Cruz the day that the tour was available. And we had just finished building the box for his guitar. So Richard's touring him around. It's like, oh, and here's, this is your guitar. It's not finished. I don't even think it has binding on it yet. But he was able to like see his guitar in process. You can't do that at Gibson or Fender or Martin or Taylor or any of the the big manufacturers, you know, and if, I mean, I get customers that are constantly asking for progress photos, you know, how's my guitar doing? Can you get me a picture of what it looks like now? You have to explain to them. It's like, okay, but once, once you put the top, once you make the top, then you have to make the back and sides. Then you have to put the top on the back and sides. And so there's nothing going on with the top while you're building the back and sides. I mean, they, I, and once again, it's perception, right? They don't understand that these things, it's a process and they take time or like, well, but how come it doesn't have binding on it? Well, because it's not at the stage of manufacturing where you put the binding on. Oh, so, I mean, part of our job in this industry, not only is to get people excited about our guitars, but I think the more we get them excited about the process, you know, that that's what really differentiates a Santa Cruz guitar from a lot of other, a lot of other manufacturers. Yeah. So well, well you're educating as well. And that's really great. You know, an educated customer is a, a much happier customer. <laughs> I think. Let me, let me caveat that with, if yeah. your education comes from reliable sources, <laughs> then you're in good shape if they are a if they're a forum forager careful careful <laughs> no i mean listen and I, I use the word forager because i go onto a forum and it's like who has time to wade through all this stuff yeah i i, I, mean, I, I you have I, to for you have to like keep looking for information but if you get down the wrong rabbit hole all you're getting is opinion not fact yeah i i i try to read the gear page daily as much as my stomach will allow me to do it and it it's just gotten worse and worse and worse and you know it, it's all this misinformation this crazy misinformation um well a lot of it's coming from people who are buying guitars from other companies and are are believing their marketing rather than understanding what the reality is behind it all so it's it's yeah that's the way the world seems to be going. But, uh, you know, that's one of the great advantages is, is when you buy a Santa Cruz, you know you're getting properly sourced and um, appropriate materials to build a musical instrument as opposed to something that just looks good. Um, and mm -hmm. you have, you know, trained people who are doing the important work of assembling it with a goal in mind rather than just putting together a kitchen cabinet. Um, there's True. just so much of it that, that, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you explain it. People will not grok it. All you have, all you can do is just kind of get them to play the guitar, listen to it and hope that they figure it out for themselves. Yeah. You know, I think that, I mean, I, I always use the example of Santa Cruz is a bit like buying a Bentley or an Aston Martin, right? You can you can get to work in anything that has four wheels and an engine and these days a seatbelt and, you know, it starts and runs. But if you've ever had a chance to drive any kind of high performance, whether it be motorcycle or car or boat, it's it's a completely different physical and emotional experience. Right. And, yeah. uh, you know, because we're, not, we can't make enough guitars to be everywhere and I don't ever think we should. Mm -hmm. So you have to, you have to see, go seek out 
and, and and I also believe that you know a lot of people want to experience the guitar for themselves at that at the level of Santa Cruz or any of the other boutique builders and um you know we're so we're not just building a guitar we're we're a we're creating a a musical and emotional experience for people we're mm -hmm. we're providing them an instrument that will last their entire lifetime and can be passed on to generation after generation um which i think is also very special i had a really interesting experience at nam it was midday and everybody was kind of out of the booth and brenda was over in the corner over there and she was talking to somebody and and she kind of looked at me and she said, would you just kind of like watch the guitars? And <laughs> I don't know, something going to come out of the sound hole, you know, what's going to happen. And this young couple walked up and I saw when the guy came around the corner, I saw his face and I saw him when he saw the Santa Cruz booth and everything about his body changed. And he walked up to this instrument and he was just standing there looking at it. And I said, do you want to play it? And he's like, are you kidding? And I said, here, let me get it down for you. And I got it down and handed it to him. There was a chair sitting there and his wife with him. It, it was Nam at noon. They both, somehow he got his ear down as close as he could. And she had her ear on the sound hole. And he was just playing some little finger style thing run up, up the neck. And you could just see his body melting. I mean, you could physically see the changes and you could see that you could see the joy that she was getting from it. You know, she was looking at him going, oh, wow, this is setting him on fire. And, and, and you could just see it. And it was so special. You know, I, I'm sorry Richard didn't get a chance to see it because it was just such a, a magical little moment, you know, of, yep. holy cow, it's the Washington Monument. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> kind of thing. Um, anything exciting new? Not that you can tell us about, but. I was, I was going to say, is there any anything you can tell <laughs> us about the future or your plans? Something that, you know, isn't completely top secret? <laughs> um, you know, it's, Coming from a larger company where a part every every once or twice a year you had new product introductions, so I keep pinging Richard and and Rick about, um, you know what what's our new product introduction going to be? So we're we're tossing around some ideas. Um, you know I don't think we've nailed anything in particular down, but I do know that. Rick and Richard have put together some plans for um, a couple of different prototypes. Oh, so. <laughs> Mandolin. <laughs> well, all, all I can say is I've been carrying this around since a fretboard journal summit quite some time ago, and I will gladly break it if Santa Cruz would come out with something similar. <laughs> Can you can you pour coffee in a hat? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> can you drink it? Can you drink it from a from a hat? That's a different story. But yeah, that's that's for sure. All right, point taken. That uh, okay. Mandolin. That might be Mandolin. that might be a good Mandolin. Mandolin. I did ask. You know, it's funny. Um, I had someone reach out to me earlier this week. I saw. I keep seeing pictures i'm looking at arch tops and the santa cruz arch tops keep popping up you know would richard ever consider building another arch top and i already knew the answer but i asked richard anyway he said we, you know that was a long long time ago it was all hand built it wasn't there were there weren't really fixtures for it so it would just be too challenging right now um but I did write back to the customer and say we, we can't build one, but I know we're, I know there's one hanging at a shop in Nashville right now. You should go check it out. Um, Where? What? Carter that, has that, one. That, Carter has one. Oh, yeah. And Ted's 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 hitting the plane ticket right now. 
<laughs> Juan. Seeing that. <laughs> no, it, no it, if, if I were to throw something out there, it would be that um, I love playing um, with my Santa Cruz and playing with the band. But something that was more like a 335, more a, a little thinner body kind of influence guitar would be really nice. Uh, and it would be something not completely out of left field for them, but you know, yeah. anyway. Well, I know at, at one point, you know, Richard was building octave mandolins or mandocellos. Is there a difference? Mandocellos, yep. Yeah. Ukuleles, yeah. even. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I've probably seen three or four. I saw Sarah, Sarah Jaros a couple of weeks ago. She was playing. Amanda Cello. Um, I saw Mary Myers, who's I think got most of her notoriety playing with Sister Sadie. I've seen her on stage with an electric Amanda Cello. So I asked Richard, I'm like, what about Amanda Cello? He's like, yeah, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I think those oh, instruments the truth, were the, the truth bodies. is we could probably build just about anything. Oh, yeah. But I, I also believe that. I don't want to say you need to you need to stay on your four lane highway. You don't need to stay in your lane, but you kind of need to stay in your four lane highway. And if if Santa Cruz came out with a either a fully hollow or semi hollow um, thinner thinner body uh, electric guitar, I I think a lot of people might have a hard time getting their head around that from a customer perspective or marketing perspective but i say that and you know look at what the guys down in austin have done they took yeah. the acoustic business and turned it into you know they make some in my opinion some of the most beautiful electric guitars available in the market so i don't i wouldn't say it's out of the question at this point but um and yeah. I'm still the, you know, I'm still the new guy. So I've only got so much influence. <laughs> yeah. no, Give me a couple of years. I under, I, yeah, no, that's, that's completely understandable. I mean, they do what they do with just their line of guitars right now is so special. Um, I would not want to suggest anything that would draw any energy away from that. Um, because I can't imagine anybody else doing what they're doing as well as they're doing it. So yeah and you know the nice thing about they can hire somebody to make coffee cups <laughs> okay. Okay. No, no, i'm writing that down right now there coffee we go cups for tad <laughs> um, that second part for tad very yeah. very important <laughs> you know, there, are many... funny. there are, it used to be you know if you wanted to do something like a coffee cup or a mug or a t-shirt or a hat you know the minimum order quantities were huge but now there are literally companies that it's like i need one mug with this logo on it they'll print it they'll ship it for you you don't make any money on it but it could be done so don't be surprised tad if you don't end up with a coffee <laughs> cup in your mailbox at some point actually i released a film three years ago that i produced and did and we are just entering into the merch realm right now. Mm -hmm. We make four times on a t-shirt sale what we make on a on a viewing. Oh, sure. And my distributor and my distributor gives me 90% of the royalties. Mm -hmm. So, but it's 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 such a cool world because it's like he said, Well, what do you want to do? And I said, How about coffee cups and he said, what about a thermos? And it's like, yeah, a water bottle would be great. You know, no, I don't think I want to do hats because, you know, but how about an organic kind of tote or something? Oh, yeah, that's easy. Here, just I'll, I'll mock it up and send it to you. And, and it, it, it's really incredible. I, I mean, again, the world's gotten very fast, but also gotten very <laughs> convenient. Yeah, I mean, that's true. We, it, it, I live at the end of the road. Monterey is really the end of the road. And I, 
I just went through a situation where I was looking for a screw <laughs> <laughs> to to put a pickup in, and it doesn't exist here. You know, the the, the hardware store just laughs at you, and <laughs> you know, you make it yourself, I guess. Well, but um, maybe we can ask him one thing. We did hear a rumor that there might be some changes coming with the cases. So is that official or is that just something that's still in discussion stage? It's it's in transition. Okay. So nice. Nice. Yeah. So we'll look forward to that. And then uh, for those of us who are local, any chance of bringing back the Christmas party? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Only if I get an invite. We are getting <laughs> Yeah, I'm not local, getting, so we are getting into such deep water here at the Christmas party. <laughs> you see, this is two veterans trying to take advantage of the new guy to get him exactly. to commit to something. Exactly. And then I have to go sell it to Richard. Uh, yeah. And and all he's gonna do is look at you and go, You talked to Richard and Tad, didn't you? And, <laughs> yeah. You know, because we tried to figure out how to do it virtually last year and and the year before we were trying to think of 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 how to do it and actually these podcasts we were just getting started um with them right before covid hit and we were doing them as audio only and um they were difficult uh mm -hmm. i would spend 3 to 4 days cleaning up you know, editing and cleaning, um, just to put it out in the world, and yeah. uh, it, it, having having Zoom and and having access. It, I think we were at like number fifteen when we started, and this is seventy nine. So, yeah. it's it, it's whoever thought we'd get past thirty. You know? and, I, I was surprised and, when we got past four. <laughs> yeah, it's um. It's been a little bit of a challenge, but um, it has been really, I, I was looking at YouTube numbers um, the other day, Tad and I were looking at them, and it's actually a pretty interesting community out there that is paying attention. Small, but you know? yeah. Small, but but paying attention. Yeah. And, you know, if, if we can enlighten one person or or do that, our job's done, you know? In, in, yep. in terms of that, if we can if we can tell this story a little bit better and give some people some insight and let people see Richard from for every couple three months, you know, and and let him let him get some of that magic that he gives to gives to us every time we see him or run into him, you know, it's it it, it truly is a magical company, and um, I think I'm excited you're there. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I am too. I it's it's been a a wonder a wonderful experience, and um, you know, as as spouses do, my wife checks in every so often. How's it going? And you know, like any job, you have days that are spectacular. You have days that are really challenging, but I always evaluate you know the whole picture, and it's such a unique company. It's owned by such a unique and amazing person. The, the people that work at Santa Cruz are so passionate about guitars and wood and quality that it's, it's, it's an environment that I think I could probably go out to a lot of my former colleagues and say, just come try this for a week and see what you think. And they'd be like, right, when's the next opening? Because I think um, it's just a very, very, it's just a very special thing all around. Yeah, it's, yeah that's a privilege, it's a privilege and an honor to be part of it. Well, it's a privilege to be able to try and do this coffee break and talk to people who are as passionate about the uh, guitars and the company as, as we have been in the past and will continue to be in the future as uh, some of these new changes come about and... I don't know. I, I've never imagined, you know, global and international sales being something that Santa Cruz would be actively pursuing. But uh, hey, that's my own little tiny perspective on the world. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a it's a small part of the business. Um, 
and it has its challenges. You know, if you look at Europe right now, Europe um, economically is 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 challenged, and the dealers are feeling that. But I think the advantage of working for a small company that cares about its partners is that we we don't have a formula, right? Yeah. I don't go to a, a new dealer and say, here's the 25 guitars you have to stock. It's like, tell me about your customers. Tell me about the guitars you do sell. Tell me what doesn't sell. Let's curate an assortment that's right for your store where you are with your customer base. And, you know, we'll we'll get there over time internationally. It's just, we just have to be patient. Well, I remember when I ran across the Santa Cruz dealer at the Cremona Music Festival about six years ago, and I was like blown away that Santa Cruz was representing there. And then uh, mm-hmm. we have our, our friend Chuzi, uh, who is doing one hell of a job uh, playing his Santa Cruz throughout northern Italy and even up into Austria, I think, recently. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, just the, out there. Just the character, if you can follow him on Facebook. Um uh he has a 34d and he's left-handed and he is now he does he does all these podcasts on the way to gigs in 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 this tiny little car and then he's now incorporated his son into the into his show who's a trumpet player wow it's this crazy italian you know with and was uh was it was um uh third at winfield yeah so okay. really can really can pick yeah. you know it, i i wouldn't i wouldn't pick up a guitar if he was in the room i wouldn't even yeah uh, no i don't do that <laughs> no i here can i can i yeah. get you another soda you know what can i do here um no an but, uh, sprints. that's what you need to get yeah <laughs> yeah uh tim we really appreciate your time thanks yes. so much thanks for coming on um I, it's uh a really uh, good thing for the for the customer base here in this country to get a chance to meet you, um, and uh, we're real excited. I, 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 boy, Richard knows how to choose good people. Excellent. Yes. You know. Well, th- thank you very much for the invitation. I'll I'll invite you to bring me back in like two years when I know a lot more than I do now because right <laughs> now it's way more intake than output. But uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you guys. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and have a fantastic afternoon. Yep. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you at the Christmas party. All right. (laughs) Sounds good. (laughs) Try to stay out any tornadoes or anything. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Tell me about it. I'll deal with, I'll deal with earthquakes. I'll deal with earthquakes any day, any day. (laughs) Give me a good earthquake any day. Yeah, but uh, I don't know about that tornado thing. So have a wonderful afternoon. Be well. All right. right. Thanks, Thanks. Tad. Thanks, Richard. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed this installment of the Santa Cruz Coffee Break. For more music-related fun, please join the Santa Cruz Guitar Players Forum at scgcpf or santacruzguitarplayers.com. If you have any questions or possible podcast topics, please contact us. If you have a product or service that you feel would be of value to our listeners, please consider adding your support and keeping the coffee pot on. Contact us for more information. We ask that you hit the like, follow, bell, or bookmark buttons so we can keep you informed of upcoming podcast episodes. We hope you enjoyed Santa Cruz Coffee Break. Now it's time to go play your guitar.